Zutrat. I'm at Brookhaven National Labs. Um, I uh, did a lot of growing up in Ghana and West Africa, and I came to the U.S. for college, and I've been here um, for sort of some years. I work at a Singatron, Brookhaven National Labs. And um, so in the last uh, lecture, I, I was aiming the talk, that talk at um, people who might want to use a synchrotron and kind of, I wanted, I, you know, there are a lot of experiments you can do with a synchrotron that are connected to material science. That's kind of what I, sort of the general area, um, actually a lot of, uh, most people actually work on there, a lot of material science. And um, so I tried to give a presentation on um, the different kinds of experiments and it, it's, it's not going to be, it wasn't complete, but that was something. That, that will sort of guide you, give you a, a view. And, uh, and then, um, so in, in, this, in this particular lecture, I, I, I kind of want to go, the way those of us who work there think about the ring, we have, we have the ring, the source itself, which is, produces the x-rays. And, and then, then, then we have those of us who work outside the ring who, who basically provide uh, experimental configurations for users to come and do the experiments. And then inside that are the actual, are the actual experiments. So, so, uh, so essentially what I did the last time was essentially speak about what the user sees. Now I'm going to go to the ring. I'm going to start at the ring, try to explain a little bit about the ring and a, a little, you know, again, it's for people who are not who are more users. And so it's just, it's not, I'm not trying to give a detailed, you know, um, mathematical description of the ring. There are many, there are many papers and many talks out there that focus on that. So it's more enough of the ring so you understand what, when you're doing your experiment. Um, and then, uh, so in, that's the first part of my talk, basically talking about the sources in the ring. Then I'll talk a tiny bit about the beam line. I had actually meant to have a longer section there, but um, just, uh, just enough to let you know something about the beam line. And then finally, I'll close with some of, some of my, um, what, what I, my work. Um, so let's, let's go. By the way, I should mention that um, most of the view graphs and uh, many, many of the pictures and things in my presentation, if you go to this website, you'll see a, a bunch of lectures which will have many of the images. And then there are actually in the process of preparing this, I found that there were some things that were better described in other places. And in most of those cases, you'll see that I've cut out the, the, the person's image and you can see, um, you can see the where the source was. And so you can, in some sense, that's like a reference if you want to think about it. Um, yeah, so this, that's what I mean by other source. I leave the source information on my borrowed quote unquote slide. Okay. Uh, let's see, how do I go to the next page? Uh, hmm. Page down. It's not letting me go. Down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, let's maybe I can do it like this. Mm -hmm. It has no control over it, it looks like. Oops, sorry. Um, It's not letting me pick. Sorry, it looks like I'm somehow, oh, well, let me try this. Let's try a slide slaughter. Okay, so this is, this is a bad way to do it. Um, okay, this is essentially the, the what I just described. 
This is, I think I'm going to prefer to like reshare it again. Yeah, yeah, just do like you did last time. Sorry, I mean, it's uh, maybe the, the best way for you, whatever okay. you feel comfortable with. Okay, let, let me, let me, uh, I'll stop share. It, it wasn't letting me go to the next image. Mm, so exactly. let's do a screen share. And I'll try the application directly. And let's see. Let's see if I can go to the next page in this case, or do I have to even maybe, no, it's not letting go. Well, our, all our preparation for nothing. I'm going to, um, Sorry. I'm going to stop sharing and like restart it. Yeah, okay. Sorry, give me a second. So we are working with state-of-the-art tools, and then we have this little thing that are a bit I, I have a, I have don't a, worry, it's normal. <laughs> don't I have it. a new computer coming, but um, when when the um, when the um, let's see, don't say. Okay, what's happening here? Don't save. Type of desktop sharing. Okay, now I seem to have control again. So let me try this again. So. Is, is, it, is it on your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now let's see if I can move. Okay. Yeah, I can move. I have no idea what happened. Okay, so yeah, so this is what the schematic of the ring, obviously this is a picture from Soleil. And basically the particles are accelerated to very high speeds, injected into a ring. So here's the ring. Usually actually you start with a booster, you spin it up to a certain speed and you try to bring up, to, these days you try to bring it, up, bring it up to the same energy as the main ring. And then you inject and then they come around. And then we show these little straight sections, and this is a, a, a beam line. Basically, we're going to look at some things about the ring, some things about this red thing here, which is an insertion device, which is can be an, a regular undulator or just a bending magnet. And as you know, people do these um, experiments, um, you know, 24 hours around the clock. So this is the ring I work at, and this shows you the scale of a high energy physics experiment versus light sources, we're much smaller. And on the left is a um, well, a brightness plot. And this is one of the things that you'll run across uh, when you're going to different, different rings or you know, for, for different kinds of experiments. It, it contains information about how bright the source is. So there are damping, um, bending magnets here, a damping wiggler, an in, in, uh, in vacuum undulator. So each source has a certain characteristic of, you know, wavelengths you can get to. And just to recall back to the last um, uh, 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 le lecture, the, the one of the advantages of, um, one of the reasons these sources continue to pop up in different places is because, because they, one of the advantages of A, they're very bright, a lot of photons. B, because you have a large range of energies, you can access um, different aspects of many materials, right? These energy ranges from 10 EV to 100 KV uh, interact well with many elements. And so that means you can, you can learn something about the material. Uh, okay, so here is, here's a brightness chart. And well, as I was saying, so the first thing I want us to do is try to understand a little bit 
what, what a brightness plot is. So the bottom axis is, is, is um, energy, of course. So this, this um, coordinate, this axis here, is um, photons per second per 0.1 percent bandwidth per millimeter squared per milliradian squared. And so there, there's your synchrotron ring, there's your insertion device, and it's, it's radiating light. So we're going to look a little bit detailed about this. So one of the things that was a little weird to me when I was learning about this is that th this plot is, is re so when it says, for example, per millimeter squared, right, it's assuming you can take a little imaginary square, you know, well, whatever shape, um, a little patch of the source. Now, this is in vacuum. You, you can't actually make this measurement. It's a conceptual measurement, right? And so the point is, these numbers are referenced at the, at the um, sort of in the ring itself. So if you could sort of take a, a small area, okay, then that's the, that'll be the amount of light coming through that little um, area. And then even if you sort of put this little imaginary uh, square there and that you were sort of counting the photons coming through, um, there would be some divergence to those. Those photons just don't go straight. There's a little bit of angular spread to them and that's the angular divergence. And so then that's that top thing, milliradi per milliradian square, right? So it just, and then sort of to go over it again, it's um, the number of photons per second per 0.1% bandwidth. And so then it's, um, you know, the, you, you've got to have a certain energy range over which you count. And so that is then what makes this plot. So this is what will be coming down your, your beam line and it's straight from the source. And you can see, so there's your bending magnet and we're going to learn about you know, it's the critical energy, which is essentially sort of near the peak of this. You can see there, um, there's a maximum. There's sort of the, what they call the critical energy is where half the photons are below, half the photons are above, I should say energy, uh, power. There's a three-pole wiggler. I actually won't mention that, but uh, because I will talk about just a regular wiggler. And you can see the wigglers go to higher energies. And we'll see why you can get a um, why you can go to higher energies for some sources and, and not others. And then finally, we'll talk about the undulator. And you can see those undulators give a lot of light uh, in certain in certain energy ranges. So first, so that's the first thing to understand the brightness plot. Okay. So now um, we'll start. Uh, with non-relativistic um, radiation. So this is sort of, I, I find that I like to make a connection between the, the things that people learn in their undergraduate physics and then try to connect it to, you know, see, so, to show you how that stuff fits in um, with something like the synchrotron. So there's this very simple, I think Lamour derived it, um, which is, you know, for, for um, an electron that's being accelerated, what does the radiation pattern look like? And so this is the classic simple derivation that um, explains it. You've got a particle that is accelerated either to a fixed velocity or to a, from velocity to a stop. And when you look at the way the, you look at, so it, if it, the, um, the field lines would go radially in both cases, right? So, um, oops, sorry. But then, but then, during the acceleration, there's a kink, and the whole the whole goal is um, to figure out how much energy is radiated in that kink, and that's what this. Um, like I said, it's it's basically out there. You've probably seen it in your. Um, undergraduate physics. So at the end of the day, you get, and this is the key point, the, that perpendicular radiation, uh, that perpendicular E field from the kink, there's a radial part and a, tra a, a transverse part. That uh, transverse part 
has a sine theta in. And it's actually quite easy to see the sine theta. If, if you're sitting over here, right, the, 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 the kink is almost completely uh, transverse. And if you're sitting over here, the kink is, there's essentially no kink. And this basically follows the sine theta is essentially what this is. And so when you, and uh, so I, it looks twisted and the letters are off because I wanted to make the direct link with sort of the, the image that was shown. So this is uh, an image showing how much radiation is going in a particular direction. So this is actually a sine squared theta. There's the acceleration direction and then there's radiation. So, okay, so that's the shape. So remember this donut-like thing is the shape of the irradiated light. Well, now let's look at it relativistically. And it, so you, you probably know you have to do, if you're doing something relativistically, uh, there's the, uh, um, you, you, you have to correct by gamma for lengths. And so for, if you imagine light being radiated in a particular direction, if you correct for uh, the fact that it's uh, the relativistic Doppler shift, as they say, basically you, you end up, um, uh, you end up with something that looks like this. You, you fold you fold the radiation into into a sm into a much smaller angle. Okay, so I was going to do that, and I was I was um, that was what I was going to do. And I was thinking about it for a second, and I was I, I something I had never I, I don't ever remember uh, thinking about, which was well, this imagine this donut and you fold it in the forward direction. What happens to the backwards direction, right? Does it get folded also? So actually, I did learn something new in preparing for this, something I didn't worry about before. And, and the, the answer to that question is down here. When you're moving non-relativistically, this is now a cut through the, through the donut, right? So when you have a non-relativistic, um, uh, you've got your little donuts, and that's the power, that's the, this is sort of angle. But when you go fully relativistic, you, it falls completely in the forward direction, as far as you can tell. And actually, you can when you go to, let's say, a half C, so this, I've forgotten where I got this from. When you go half C, basically, you can see there's a remnant of, of, one, of the, one of the lobes. So the power completely gets folded in the forward direction. And so this was uh, done, I believe, Maybe it wasn't for the first time, but you know this is the the reference that a lot of people use. So this is from their paper, Hartman, and so there's the non-relativistic case, and there's the relativistic case. And so I, I why why relativistic? I forgot to mention that these rings. Oh no, I did mention the the, the electrons are accelerated. Um, I'm sorry, are uh, close to the speed of light, very very large gamma. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute. And so the effect is, it folds the radiation forward direction, the angular, this angle here, essentially is one over gamma. And gamma is um, the, the, the ring energy over the rest mass of the electron. Um, so we're going to go over these three kind of sources, which we very often find at a, a synchrotron. You've got the bending magnet, which is, we'll, we'll start with that. So that there's the one over gamma angular. So the electrons are coming around the ring relativistically, and um, the uh, th that's the angular divergence from that thing. And that's a typical spectrum from a bending magnet. Then we will talk about the wiggler, and in the wiggler, the, it's basic. I'll, I'll come to that. It, it has a large angle. We'll, we'll come to that later. Okay, so to do the bending magnet, we'll, we'll, we'll start um, with a very familiar problem that you get in your first year somewhere. An electron moving in a magnetic field, forces V cross B, um, the accelerations mv squared upon R, and when you finish, you end up with an orbit mv or QB. And then luckily, because um, the velocity is perpendicular to the B field or any acceleration, um, you can, you, it's easy, kind of easy to do the, the, 
the relativistic case, you just add gamma in front of the M. Um, okay, and it is gamma C. So, so here, and then, the, okay, that's right. Here's gamma, ring energy. That's how fast the electron's moving over its rest mass. And so for, and so you work it out, and basically it is 1957 times R ring energy. For NS plus two, our ring energy is three GeV, so gamma is 587.1. And then when you work out what that is, uh, it's like 10 to minus four. four. So it's the angular rate, you know, is, uh, and that's, that folding forward, that reduce, you know, it makes it a much more efficient source to use than a lab source, right? The lab source, when you get the radiation, it's going into four pi, this is all going into some small angle, which makes it more useful. So, so we have to like quickly go through this. And so I'll, I'll try and point out what the essential point is. So imagine you're sitting, um, and let me, let me explain what, what, what we're gonna do here. We want to quickly find out um, in a, you know, I've forgotten where did I get this from? Yeah, Berkeley Labs, um, Professor Atwood, UCLA. Uh, he's got a couple of books out on, on this kind of stuff. And, but there are many other sources for this, but this I think is his, his um, simple derivation. So you, um, first we're gonna find out how wide, if you're, if you're sitting, you're looking at the synchrotron, the electron beam comes around. We wanna find out how wide the pulse of light is. Because if we do um, by um, essentially a Fourier transform, uh, uncertainty principle, you can get um, where that critical energy is. What's the bandwidth of radiation, right? There's a, you know, there's delta T, delta omega uh, relationship. So anyway, so here we go. Let, let's try to do it. And because it's relativistic, it makes it a tiny bit more complicated. So imagine that you've got your one over gamma angular radiation. So you, you, you figure out when you start to see the light. So at that point, the, essentially the light travels in this direction, so it's starting. Meantime, the electron beam is also going around, right? And so between those two things, between the, the light starting and then the, the electron beam coming along, you can, there's going to be a certain time, and that's the essence of this, this section here. Here's the arc length, so this is the electron going around, almost the speed of light, and then this is the radiation path, which is that. And you can you, you 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 go through you go through, and you get the the time of the pulse width is m over e b gamma squared. Okay, good. So now now we can do our, our critical bending magnet critical energy, and it's you know there, there's a there's a, a, a sort of quote unquote correct way to do this, but this essentially gets the right answer. It doesn't get all the numbers right, though, but nevertheless. So, so since we know this delta tau, you use that, and we pull in our delta tau from the previous page. So the the energy bandwidth is is becomes this, and so this critical energy has half the power below, half the power above. And if you like, make it more useful, meaning you get all the constants and you know, typical units, right? People typically have magnets. Uh, in Tesla and ring energies in GeV. So you get this kind of relationship. If I know, if I know my ring energy and know my magnetic field, I can tell you where that um, critical energy is. And so right away, you can see now on that, um, on that plot I showed of the, I've forgotten what I call it again, <laughs> the spectral plot, um, the brightness plot, right. Um, you can see if you saw something that had, if you saw a source like a wiggler that went to high energies, it probably had, and it's all on the same source. So the ring energy is the same for all those, right? Means, it means your magnetic field in your wiggler is stronger than the magnetic field of some of the other sources which went into lower energies. So right away, that's kind of a useful insight for you to have. So, <clears throat> It's a good time to go to a wiggler. This is what physically a wiggler looks like. It's um, uh, basically, actually, so right, these are, um, they're all these little magnets and they're alternating up and down. And you can see 
in comes the electron, one field going one, maybe going up, moves it one way, and then the going down brings it back. And so the, the electron wiggles its way through the, um, through the, in, well, we, this is a, the generic name is an insertion device because you insert that into the ring. So um, hopefully if they do their job right and it's actually very careful work they have to do, they, they, they trim it so that it's, the electron comes in, wiggles its way through the lattice and leaves. And it doesn't, it, it, in some, ideally you put the insertion device in and it doesn't move the beam at all. But as you can imagine, some things, you know, if it's not properly optimized, they won't do that. One of the things I had wanted to do for this talk was to give you a sense, you know, of how you can see this massive thing. Why does it look so massive? And the answer is when you close the jaws on this thing, the forces, um, uh, between these ma these magnets are very high. They are tons. These things really hold. So so the 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 one of the complexities of these th these devices is holding the jaws to a fixed position or, and being able to control them. Because as you'll see later, we want to control um, the set the separation between the poles so that we can control the magnetic field. Okay. Um, so. Basically, the, you know, the ideal, idealized magnetic field you'd put in here that this, undulate, this um, insertion device would give you is something, let's say, in the y direction, sinusoidal, right? It's sort of like the lowest order. Even though you put, you know, physical, you know, magnets, um, very often you just simply assume you've got a sinusoidal magnetic distribution. So you do the same thing you had before, mass times acceleration force. And let's see. I so there's, there's a question on the chat. Um, can I oh, okay, I, I can't hear it. What do I do? Uh, um, Sayid. Yeah, let's see. Is there somewhere I go to? No, he that? should ask the question if he's, uh, okay. he can talk. Oh, sorry, Prof. Yeah, I just want to know, like the graph of the bending magnets, the energy uh -huh. is yeah. it described by a normal distribution curve. No, uh, it is. <laughs> uh, it, unfortunately, not. It's kind of a, a complicated function, and I will refer you to. So it turns out this part here goes as I think x to the one e to the one third or something. I think. And then I forgot, and then there's another, there's actually another functional form that, so in the old days when they did an analytic, um, they had two functional forms and then, you know, they, they often couldn't quite get them to match over there. I've forgotten what they are, but I, I do remember that this one's x to one third, I've forgotten what this one is. Um, so there are two functional forms and I think now they just do it numerically. So they, they, don't, they don't worry about that. Um, but if you look, there's a, a particular reference out. There's like a very classic, let's see if I can find the, um, the, the, the thing, because I was looking at it today. I think it's this one here. No, it's not this one. There is something, something by Sands. Um, and I don't, I don't see it here. I'll, I'll try and find it for you. And if you send me an email, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link. Oh, here it is. So let's see. I think this is like the, everyone refers to this. Can you see this? No. So it's by Matthew Sands UCS and it is called, I'll, I'll send you the link. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, um, so the, yeah, the short answer is no, it's not a normal distribution. It's something more complicated. And Today, you know, they, they really just do everything numerically anyway. So, they, right, where, was, where was I? Hmm. Right. Okay. Um, so, like I was saying, basically, this is your usual what kinematic equation, I guess. 
and you, you put in your, your magnetic field and when you sort of write it out, um, you get something you get something like this from the first integration. And there is a parameter which we're going to run into occasionally. And it basically contains the magnetic field and it contains the spacing of the undulator, the, the periodicity of the magnets. Okay, so we'll see this um, again. So, so, oh, right. So in any case, with, with going through this, um, you, you, can, you can show that the, the maximum angular deflection is, is this. And, and this then allows us to understand what's the difference between a wiggler and an undulator. So this K gives you, like I was saying, gives a scale of the electron motion in the magnet, right? So, and, um, okay, peak, peak angular deflection is K over gamma. So what, what that means is that, um, so there's this um, electron wiggling through the lattice and it's giving, it's, it's de deflecting in angles K over gamma. But remember that the, the radiation from this plot as I, I show over there, remember the angular radiation coming out is one over gamma. And so there, it sets up two limits. If, if K is much, much bigger than one, then if you imagine that the electron's going down, essentially each um, hole, each time the thing goes through a wiggle and, and radiates light, it's just completely uncorrelated from, you know, they all, all, all of those poles are radiating independently. And so what that looks like is it looks like you've got, you know, if you have N, N um, uh, magnet, you know, periods, then it looks like you have N bending magnets, which we already worked out, right? So, uh, so that's the wiggler. So it looks like you're going to, so you're going to get N times the flux, actually 2N because it wiggles one way, then wiggles the other. So, 2n times the flux. So that's the difference between a Begley magnet and a wiggler. It's, it's, it's got 2n times the flux of a thing, of a, of a bending magnet. And, and then, de you know, depending on how big k is, um, the, the, angular, the angular width is bigger. So that's the first limit. k is much, much bigger than 1. If k is of order 1 or less, then what happens is, even though the, 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 the electron bends one way and bends the other, it's still essentially radiating light into the same cone. So the radiations can interfere with each other. Okay. Oh, so actually, sorry, here. Here's uh, what I just was saying. So, right, so the ma maximum deflection angle is K over gamma. So that means that the horizontal divergence, and so that's something that I kind of showed you earlier, but I didn't uh, completely mention. You can see, try to conceptually say that the wiggler has more light in it than the bending magnet because it's sort of taller. Remember, this is um, the, the, the brightness curve. And you can see that the angular range of light coming out is K over gamma instead of one over gamma and two in times the flux. I kind of said that already. For the, for the undulator, a little more work is needed. And I'll, I'll admit that I didn't I'll, I can talk through it, and um, but I, I didn't, I'm not going to derive it here. And uh, so, right, for the, for the more work that's needed is, okay, fine, it's okay that you've got K is less than one, so the, the radiations are interfering, the radiation of the different poles are interfering with each other, but you have to have phase matching for, for it to sort of have some physical effect. And so what you have to have is you have to have so that the electron travels through the lattice and comes back in phase with the radiated light from the previous turn. I don't know if that makes any sense. So now if it's sort of radiating at some wavelength and it kind of 
whatever the wavelength is, is we'll find out what it is. And then it, it matches with the other one. You can't, you get interference. And then, you know, every time, you, if you remember, because you do the square of something, if you have twice something, then it, the um, power goes as four times because you square twice of whatever it was. So if you have n, n of these poles and it comes back in phase n times, now you're going to be peaking up by n squared, um, the light. And you'll see the effect of that in a minute. So the main point is that there's a fate, there has to be a matching phase relationship between the electron zooming through the wiggles and the light that's coming radiated out. And there's even a little bit of angular stuff. So, um, so that's the equation that you get if, if you work through that phase matching thing. I, I didn't think I'd have enough time, so I didn't actually you know, go over that. But I just did want to point out that it turns out, so there's the wavelength coming out from the undulator. <clears throat> there's the, that's the magnetic, that's the period of the magnetic lattice. I mean, the period of the, yeah, the magnet, period of the magnetic lattice. And then you've got your gamma squared. And so someone might ask why you have gamma squared and sort of that the hand wavy explanation was the following. You've, you've, you've got the electron zooming through the magnetic lattice. It sees um, everything shortened by, by gamma. And then when it radiates, it also, when you come back to the lab frame, that's another gamma. And so that's gamma squared. And uh, so anyway, that's the, that's the equation. And if you can remember, uh, this K, which tells us about how much the electron wiggles, um, contains both the lambda U, the, the magnetic lattice period, and it contains the magnetic field. Um, so the magnitude of that. And so, and so basically if you change, so you're not gonna change the magnetic lattice, but the length, uh, the length. but you can change the magnetic the magnitude of the B field. And so, and so, and so the thing that's cute about this is you, again, you can, you can, by, by changing the magnetic field, you can change the wavelength of emitted light. And so that's why you have this magnetic lattice, and then you've got these, um, what do you call them, uh, actuators. So you can move the, 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 the poles together. Right, so, so the, basically the closer the poles are, the larger is the magnetic field. And it's, it's a whole, in, in, the, in, the, in the lattice, I mean, this is actually something we did uh, on our beam line. Um, you know, this is all motorized and whatever. And so we, we weren't sure that the electron beam was going right down the center of that. Because if you, if you go down the center, you're going to get the optimized amount of light. So we did sort of some, some what we call commissioning and we played around with the height of the electron beam relative to the, 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 the gap. And, uh, and then the other thing I just want to mention as a practical matter is that there is, you know, on all of these things, um, first of all, when, they, when they're beginning uh, to put the, the electrons in, they basically open up the gap and then they, they inject and then they close the gap. And, Anyway, that's in the beginning. And they are very, the ring people are very careful to make sure you don't close the gap too much. So it's, it's set at a limit. You can't go beyond that. Um, and most often, it turns out, the closest the gap is, the most light you get out of it. And so that's often where we run. And so the co a consequence of that interference I was talking about is that you you have um, <clears throat> this is this is what an undulated spectrum looks like. You, you you remember all the other ones had pretty much a uniform um, um, it was a uniform flux out compared to as a function of energy, whereas these you get a first, a third, a fifth, and there are you know, where are the even ones? Well, the simplest answer is, well, if you think about it, the electrons wiggle one way, then they wiggle the other. So they cancel, almost cancel. It turns out, you can see there's a little bit of light there, and that's because, the, you know, 
many of, many of the calculations that you know work on this assume a single electron, then that cancellation would be perfect. But when you have a bunch of electrons with a certain size, then the cancellation isn't quite perfect, and you get some light at the second harmonic. There's another um, question on the chat. Okay, thanks because I'm not monitoring that. Yeah. So please Maybe. stop me when, when you want. Mm -hmm. I'm listening. Maiki, you want to talk? He wants us to know what is the shortest wavelength you can get. So that's the highest energy. So it, it, it's, so it depends on the source, right? So um, we have sources, if, let me go back to the, um, so uh, this is not specific to the undulator, actually. So I'm going to go just to the, if, if you're asking about high energy, it turns out that, um, let's see if I can go there quickly. So let's pick this one, for example. Okay. So what you'll notice, let's take uh, the damping wig, though which is this one here. So what you'll notice is the power drops off. Now, the truth is it drops off. This is a log log plot, right? It's, it's dropping off. So there is light all the way out, right? It's just that from our frame of reference, it's not useful, right? There's just not enough to do something with. But if you really want to, and if you're willing to wait, basically, if you, of course, if your source gets weak and you're willing to count longer in your experiment, you will get light, you know, it just goes out. So it, it's not, I, I hope that gives you some flavor. So this one here, you can see we get to 100 kV. If you go, so, mm, good point. Um, let's go to... Sorry, I'll go here. Mm. Right, okay. If you remember back here, we went through, and I said, the critical energy. So that's, again, that point was half and half. Um, has the ring energy here, right? And the magnetic field. And I said, okay, most people will change the magnetic field. But supposing you have an experiment that absolutely needs very, very high energies. Well, right away, you go to a ring that has very high energies. So there are, there are three rings right now that have the highest uh, ring, the, the energy of the um, energy of the electrons in the ring. So uh, R ring, NSLS2, is 3 GeV. APS, I think, is six, six or seven. The highest one is AP, um, spring eight in Japan. I think it's seven. And then ESRF is also six, six to seven keV. So, and if you, if you look at the brightness plots for, for, their, for their rings, you'll see they will generally do better at higher energies than, than, than we will we'll get more light. And that's just because the ring energy is higher. So you have a choice. I mean. Basically, if we can put a, a stronger magnet in, so can APS. And so they'll get more light out at the same place. So I, I hope that's kind of a long answer. I hope that sort of answers your question. So there's light all the way out there. And if, you, if your experiment really needs higher, higher energies, then you go to the, you, you can do it at light source counting longer, or you can go to APS or spring eight. Let's see where my was. Did did that satisfy the gentleman? Uh, I think that is fine. He's not uh, responding. Oh, he's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So here's some properties, and I I, I wish I'd had time to do the do the derivation, but it's 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 very, it's sort of a little bit simple. Um, so. The, the angular divergence 
of the undulator basically goes as two lambda and then n lambda u, right? So what, what is this? This is the length of the undulator. And so that, if, if you think about it being an interference phenomenon, then it's kind of makes sense that the length of the undulator shows up in this equation. Basically, the longer the undulator is, the narrower the angular distribution is going to be of the, you know, of the beam. And, and similarly, uh, also, um, there's uh, so from the point of view of bandwidth, essentially the more, um, the more magnets you have, again, the narrower those harmonics are. And the, the, the width of, and by a harmonic, I'm, I'm saying one of these things. You can see how it's really sharply spiked. Oh, I didn't forget, forget to mention one thing, which is that um, if I was to plot a bending magnet distribution on this, it would look like this. It would be some much, much lower. I'm not even sure how low it would be on the plot. But there would be light everywhere, right? But essentially what the undulator does through constructive and destructive interference of all the poles is it sort of collects all that energy and puts it into specific wavelengths or actually there's a, the range, the width, oops, the range of wavelengths around one of those lines this is like I was saying is it sort of corresponds to the length of the undulator. So that's one of the things you, and of course the length of the undulator goes as cost, right? How much money do you have um, to buy a long undulator. And it, by the way, sometimes, even if you have a lot of money, mechanics and, you know, practicalities won't let you. Um, you can buy a big, long undulator, but it won't stay stable. And then it, it's of no use to you anyway, because you want, the you want it to be perfect. If you've got tons, tons, of, uh, tons of force, it's very hard to keep everything stable. Okay, so the, those are some of them I wanted to mention, the, the angular width of the light from the undulator and then the, the bandwidth. So that brings us to back to brightness. Now, did I even mention brightness earlier? I think, yeah, I guess I did. In any case, <clears throat> um, so here's the brightness. It's sort of on the top is essentially the amount of light coming out. And on the bottom are these four terms and here they are expanded a little bit. So let's look at sigma x. So this is, uh, actually, I, I have this one labeled, so I'll show, do y. There's the electron beam size. So, you, you know, the, this, the electron beam size is sort of from the, it's from how the people who make the ring, um, how much they can control the, the electrons, you know, being, how do I say? Anyway, it's uh, the people who make the ring, they try to make the, the electron beam size as small as possible. But it's going to have a finite size because the electrons in the bunch kind of like push away from each other. Okay. And, and also when they, you know, I'll, I'll skip that. So there's the electron beam size, right? And then there's the effective um, radiation beam size. And I think I, um, yes, right, right. So I, I think I like skipped one view that I should have put in. Um, so I said the angular divergence is this, is, this, is this quantity, you know, two lambda over n lambda. So it has a certain angular divergence. And, oh yeah, I, I actually put this here. Okay, I, want, I, I, I missed a little bit. So if you work out what this is, what is the angular divergence of the undulator? You'll see that basically because of the interference of the poles, the angular divergence is of order 10 to the minus five radians. If you put it in the wavelength and how long a typical um, in, um, magnet array is a typical insertion device, this is two to three meters, right? It's what you can reliably purchase. And so that, you work through the numbers, it's 10 minus 5. And I, and I want to remind you that the angular divergence of just, you know, just, um, let's say, from a bending magnet in the vertical would be 10 to the minus 4. This is that gamma that we worked out earlier, 1 over 5871. 
10 minus 4. So the point is that the being the undulator, it has narrowed down the, the divergence. And so the next thing is if you know the angular divergence of something, if you know the angular divergence of some radiation, you can calculate um, the effective source size from um, there's a sigma, sigma prime is uh, lam lambda, lambda over four prime. So there's a Fourier transform relationship again between the angular divergence and the source size. So let's go back to the next one, right? I think I had that in the first, I think I had that more explicitly in the first lecture, not here. But in any case, <clears throat> so imagine you're sitting outside the source and you're looking at it. Um, the, the, we, know, we know what the angular divergence is, so we can calculate the effective, um, effective radiation source size. You take the electron source size and the effective radiation source size and you square them, and then that's your source's effective source size, right? So you, you can do that for both X and Y. And then for the, rate, for the divergence, you, you again do that, right? So the electron beam coming along, um, you, you try to minimize the electron beam um, divergence, right? It's angular uncertainty. And you, know, you add that to the radiation size. And then this gives you the, the net of the, um, the net angular divergence of your, of your source, which is kind of what you see. So the goal for the ring designers is to make the source diffraction limited, which means that I want to keep the electron beam size and electron divergence less than, hopefully much, much less than, um, much, much less than the, the radiation parts of it. And if you can do that, so that's essentially what, like what a laser is. A laser has, you know, it has a source size in there and it's uh, direction limited. Whatever the source size and angular divergence, it gives you that, that, uh, that essentially one of the things about a laser. Um, <clears throat> and so then to, to, to nail that point a little bit um, more, so if you think about it, remember that, um, okay, actually here, here you have the thing I missed out and was in lecture in one. So the, you know, for something that's diffraction limited, um, you'd have say sigma r will be something like that. And sigma, the, the divergence, so that's the source size, the, oops, the radiation source size, and that's the radiation angular divergence, which you know, we have this lambda l. So if you, if you multiply that, you get lambda, basically. The L's cancel out, okay? So that's why as you go to bigger, um, bigger wavelengths, you end up, the sources today, a, a, a lot of them are diffraction limited out here because the, 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 the beam size in the ring is some fixed amount. The electron size, source size, and the electron angular divergence is a fixed amount. But as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, eventually the radiation source size and ang radiation angular divergence get big enough um, that the electron beam is, is negligible. And so then that, that so for low, low energies or big wavelengths, um, many rings are diffraction limited. However, as you get to harder X-rays, which is kind of where I work, I think I work around here, 0.1 nanometers. Um, the electron beam is still sort of limiting. Although to be fair, it's uh, in our ring in the vertical, it's diffraction limited, but in the horizontal, it's not. So, the, and that's the direction in which all new sources are going. They keep trying to bring this number so far down that eventually gets, you know, you get diffraction limited across the entire range or practical range, which is, I would say, 100. I, I don't actually see too many people doing experiments above 150 keV. And even 100, and, let's say 100 to 150, very few sources actually do it. So I, I don't know how far this will, you know, how far they will worry about trying to make it diffraction limited. 
Okay. So. <clears throat> Okay, something I had really wanted to do a slightly nicer job on was to, to let, let the students know that um, the, it isn't like a continuous stream of electrons in there. If you think about it, we, we've been talking about um, <clears throat> the electrons going by these insertion devices and radiating energy out. Well, so if you radiate energy out, then the electrons lose some energy. And so you have to put energy back in. And so there are, and this is, this is what was missing. Um, this missing thing is there's a, there's a place in the ring where you put energy back into the electrons and it's in the RF section. There's, there's, an, there's an RF cavity. And essentially what happens is there's this RF source and it's um, coming along. And if you, if you bring the electrons at just the right point uh, compared to if they're just the right phase compared to the RF, um, you know, if the RF wave and the, and the electrons come, to, come together at the right phase, they gain energy. If you go at the wrong, wrong phase, if you're off phase, it'll, um, it'll loop, you can sort of dump the beam, lose, lose energy. And, um, and then I think there's one more step in there where by fi finding the right phase point, you make the orbit stable. Anyways, um, that's missing. However, there is a residual of that RF cavity stuff that I didn't quite get to, um, which is, you know, there are there are bunch the the electrons are in bunches. They're not in streams. And and why is it in a bunch? Because within, if you think about the the, R, the RF field. There's going to be something like potential minima in there, and then the sort of the electrons fit inside those little buckets. And in fact, that's how they talk about them. They they talk about these buckets, and this is the distance between these two things is is a bucket, and it's typically one over the RF frequency. Um, let's see, I was going to say about that. You know, you have so you have these potential minima in which you can throw a few electrons. If you throw too many in and you fill up the bucket completely, the ones near, you know, that fall outside the potential minima, kind of they, they get lost, right? So there's, there's an art to filling the buckets. You don't have to fill every single bucket. And so you can put in different, um, different, um, uh, you can see here, they have something where they've got a, a bright bucket and essentially a couple of basically a, a gap and then sort of normal normal buckets and what you would do with something like this is you could do an experiment where if you want to do a fast experiment you you would synchronize your experiment with the with the bright bucket you know there there, there are triggers from the ring and so within this period you would get no other photons right no, no other light to come to just you know mess up your experiment so you can hit it and then you can watch what happens as a function of time in this little gap. I, I just wanted to mention that, but I didn't do a good job in preparing that part. All right, <clears throat> so I think we've covered the main sources on the ring. Um, so you wanna build a beam line, you wanna do an experiment, or you wanna do actually a class of experiments, that's what you build a beam line for, you aim your beam line to be designed to optimize a certain group of experiments. So if, you, if you're looking at small samples, right, which is sort of the thing I, I do, um, basically you need the high brightness. You need an undulator. And mm, uh, I, there, are the, there are other parts of that, but I'll let it go. Um, if you're doing spectroscopy, so spectroscopy, you're typically scanning energy. Now, you kind of don't want to do that when the undulator because it's kind of, it's very hard to synchronize everything you know as you change as you change the gap you end up changing the heat load on all your beamline optics and so then the beam line beam will wander a little bit and so for you doing spectroscopy and you you're scanning energy you're better off with a wiggler you know even though you have less light coming out all across the spectrum the total heat load on your optics will be the same. You just select, you, you just get your monochromatist to select out the little bits of light where you want it. And 
but the, and the beam will stay stably, you know, where, you know, where everything else is because everything is sort of warmed up to the same, same level. The heat load is an issue for the stability. I mean, it's an issue for many things. Oh, all oh, right. So I'm saying, yeah, choose, choose your insertion device, which is undulator or wiggler. So now you have to, as I've mentioned earlier, um, you get kilowatts of power coming down the pipe. And you can't put this on many, most things would melt if you let that full power come down. And so you have to manage, manage the power. And there are different ways. I'm just going to talk about two typical ways. If, if you, if you, so, uh, so this, uh, this approach is actually used by the XPD beam line, which has the high, it has the, the wiggler, the, the damping wiggler, it goes to high energies. So with high, with, if their experiments are more for the high energy, they don't really care about the low energies, but there's a lot of power there. So what you do is you put a filter in. It's a thin piece of material that can absorb the energy. And if you look in the CXRO database, I hope you can see this, but there's an attenuation length, right? So that's right. Actually, here's what the functional form for something. So supposing I have a filter of a certain thickness. Okay, so then the, the amount of light that gets through is the filter thickness over the attenuation length. All right, fine. So pick a filter thickness. And if you have a certain filter thickness, there's going to be a point in, in, as a function of energy where your filter will be about the same size as the filter thickness. So if you're at energies below that, then this is, let's say, this is small, this becomes this big, you really damp, you really kill all the softer x-rays, right? So, and then, but all the, um, if you go to high energies and this is smaller than that, then light goes through. And so just to restate that so it's clearer, you, there's going to be critical energy. Um, we'll call, I call it here the filter energy. So for energies much, much less than the filter energy, they're completely attenuated or not completely, but really cut down. And so all that power goes onto the filter, which is just a straight piece of some straight piece of something. It doesn't uh, it basically saves your optics downstream. And then the ones you want for this particular beam line, the higher energies, they just come through or hard, hardly attenuated. So this is like a high pass energy filter. If you want to think about that. So that's one way to control the um, power coming down a beam line. Second way, is um, a water-cooled mirror or a liquid nitrogen-cooled mirror if you, you're adventurous. And here the game is the following. And it's in, in, in the first uh, lecture, I mentioned something called the critical angle. And basically, it's the angle, um, for, if you had a particular energy, so it turns of, depends on energy, it depends on the material. Depend, and the delta has energy dependence and the, I'm sorry, the delta has energy dependencies and, and electron density dependence in there. So, okay. So anyway, the point is I have um, light coming in of, you know, all energies. It's at a particular angle. There will be, um, there will be some energies where this angle is too high and they don't, the light doesn't get reflected. So the high energy, higher energies above something will go right into the mirror. And that means that all that energy is going to get dumped in the mirror, which is why you have to water cool it or, yeah, most, most people water cool it simpler. Um, and then the energies that are lower than that energy get reflected and then go down your beam line. Now you can use that. And so if you think about it, this is now the opposite of what I just told you, which is now this is now a low pass filter. It'll allow so it will allow uh, lower energy photons below some critical and critical energy to come down the line. So we actually use this in our in our beam line. So then the okay now you've got to select your your energy for your experiment, and the considerations are energy ranges. So basically, there are two choices, and I'm a hardware X-ray person, so I'm almost always talking about stuff above two and a half kilovolts. So above two and a half kilovolts, crystal monochromators are okay. I'll do that in the next page or two. And the other things you want to worry about, oh, the, below that energy, they typically use gratings, just like in light 
um, visible light spectrometers, which are grading based. But of course, with <laughs> x-rays, everything is more complicated and more, more expensive. Um, you need to think about the bandwidth that you want for your experiment. Some people, if you're trying to do an experiment where you, 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 you know, let's suppose you're doing like an, maybe an XAPS experiment where the, the energy is very, a very critical parameter. You want an, a narrow energy bandwidth. If you don't care about energy bandwidth and you're just doing simple diffraction, you want as much light coming through, you can relax your bandwidth. And uh, of course, efficiency, which is an obvious statement. And one thing I forgot to put on this is stability. You know, the, the way our beam lines are kind of so, kind of so optimized, um, the stability of all the optics is an important thing. Um, okay, so this is what a monochromator looks like. It's actually from the same company as ours is, but I think it's a, this one's a little different from ours. Um, so as you saw, most of the beam lines are like long straight sections. And so this is the most popular kind of monochromator. It uses two crystals. Here's the first one. You've got the light from the syn synchrotron coming. All colors of light are coming from the source, right? Even if you have the undulator, it has first harmonic, third harmonic, all those coming in. And then you reflect. And on that first reflection, you cut down a lot of power. I mean, mo you cut down a lot of the wavelengths, but actually still not, not really enough. And then on the second reflection, basically you essentially end up pointing the beam back down the same direction, right? And that's the advantage of this. This is why um, we like this. Uh, we like this one. You, you, you would not use a single bounce because that would you 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 couldn't get your experiment to be chasing the beam, so you put one of these things in and just it's a small shift of the beam, and then um, but but you but the diff the point is what the monochromator has done for you is you had all colors coming in, and on the other end is just a, a single color, and of course, how single is single? There's going to be a bandwidth for that, and um, turns out the bandwidth is set by the choice of the crystal, right? So. Silicon crystals have a narrow bandwidth. I think diamond crystals have narrower than narrower yet than that, and germanium crystals have very wide bandwidth. Um, and oh, right, I remember trying to uh, saying that there's, you know, why can't you run, why can't you run the monochromator all the way down to, um, all the way down to very low energies? And here's the answer. In our first um, lecture, I remember telling you about lambda's 2D sine theta, which is sort of the familiar Bragg equation. So if you take a typical material, which is, you know, so silicon is very popular because it's one of the most perfect crystals you can buy in terms of you've got to have it big enough and silicon, you can buy big silicon crystals, which are perfect all the way through. If you, if you can compromise, you can get a few other things, but so silicon, so let's just do the case for silicon. What you will find is after you're done with it, you find that the, the minimum, if, if, if you could somehow get the first crystal to bounce the beam, you know, here's the beam coming in, oops, sorry, in and then bounce it back and then bounce it back again, right? So almost 180 degrees. Um, if you could do that, which you can't, you, you actually have to stop a little bit before that, before you get to 180 degrees you could get to two kilovolts. So you can use this above two kilovolts, but you can't go below that because you can't, you can't arrange the photons to come out. So th that's why you can't use monostem. So I'll say a little bit of, about our beamline. So one thing I realized, uh, and I, I had wanted to show a real picture, and I, I, I realized ever since we built it, I haven't taken the, this equivalent picture, which I really would like to have. So here's our beamline. We've got the first hutch, which has most of our optics and it has our monochromator in there. It has our two mirrors in there. Um, here's an S, here and here is an SSA and um, something else. So there's uh, uh, the, first, the first hutch, um, which is actually, so my boss is Christy Nelson. I, I unfortunately, did, I don't think I put her on this pic, in this view graph, I should have put her in somewhere. And, um, and then this is my hutch in the back there. We'll, we'll, we'll go over them a little bit. So this, now let's forget about the, the, the boxes. And by the way, I should say that these boxes, so that one there 
which gets essentially the white radiation from the source. That is four inches of lead. Um, I, I don't think you can imagine that's how thick the walls are, four inches of lead. And lead is very heavy if you've ever picked up anything like that. And that you need that kind of radiation protection because the light that comes out of here, all energies, you know, you know, someone was asking about high energies. The, the, the photons go out to the highest, very high energies and, and, and the high energies come right through, right? So you, that's why you need very thick uh, lead walls. Anyway, the, 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 the design philosophy, most of that taming, taming of the beast happens over here. And then down here, these hatches pretty much get monochromatic light. And so they don't need as much radiation. The walls here are steel and just not as thick. Um, okay, so let's pull, pull away the walls and now you'll see all of some of the things we've been talking about. There's your in vacuum undulator. There's your magnetic array that serves as your source. And you notice we've drawn this thing here. That's the shield wall. This is behind, so, you know, that's behind the ring. And then we've got the first focusing mirror. So this is, this is how I said we, we, tame, we tame a lot of the light, a lot of the power. And we, we actually, in our case, our monochromator has to do also some of the taming because um, our monochromator is liquid nitrogen cooled um, monochromator. And, you know, that's, that's because even though this cuts out a lot of power, there's a fair amount of power that gets here also. And I'll skip this for now, but this dual face plate um, goes with something that uh, someone talked about the other time. If you want to do magnetic scattering, you want to control the polarization of the light. And this is the area that my boss works in. So then you have the second, so you focus on the horizontal, focus in the vertical, we'll skip this guy. And then we have secondary source aperture, which I'll mention a little tiny bit about here. And then, then here are our experiments. And let's see what I have next. So this is an example of physically what um, a mirror might look like. The mirror is inside this vacuum system. And, um, you know, it's about um, and two, meters, two meters long. It's a big steel can. Um, and, you know, basically the beam line is all, on, all evacuated. Right, a lot of things to worry about. And um, let's see. Okay, so actually, maybe let's see if this does it right. I will. I will. I actually have. On second time, okay, I'll, I'll do this. So, as so as much as the people who do the ring, you know, try. They, they really can't make a source that's diffraction limited for us, right? So they, 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 they do a pretty good job, but especially in the horizontal direction, the source size is kind of big. And uh, so our approach is by putting a secondary source aperture down the beam line. So, you know, we tame all the power here, we've got our single, foot, single wavelength coming out. Then we have slits down here. And this slit allows me to close the light, close the, the, so if I'm sitting with an experiment here and I'm looking back at these slits, right? If I have it open, the, 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 the source is going to be not diffraction limited, but I can keep closing the slits, right? And as I close the slits, it, 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 costs, it costs me photons, right? I'm gonna throw away light, but eventually I get to the point where now standing back here, it looks like I have a diffraction limited source, right? So if I, you know, uh, and then, then I can use that in my experiment because some of my experiments want to have a diffraction limited, diffraction limited, um, what, you know, source. So that's how we use the beamline to get around what the ring cannot do. And of course, the, the ring people keep trying to make things better, so. So here's an example and of, of some work that we do with this, um, with this beam line. So um, this beam line was, was designed for a group of users that study growth, growth of materials. And the, in this particular kind of growth, there's something called uh, laser PLD. Actually, it's PLD, 
pulsed laser deposition. So they have these powerful lasers. You, 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 you know, you've, you've got your surface on which you want to grow, right? And then you have <clears throat> your target stuff that you're going to grow. So you, you, you zap a laser pulse onto the target. There's another question on the chat. Um, okay, I'm listening. Abdella, I, I don't, do you know which slide uh, the question is about? Well, ask the question and maybe I can figure it out. Okay, said so what is the cause of the sudden decline in the previous curve? Um, previous I, I stepped away for a moment so I don't remember exactly which uh, slide it was on. That, I think it was a long time ago. It might be for the critical energy. Um, maybe the one, no, not this one. I think there's one that has a, a kink uh, going oh. down. Oh, you mean, you mean this? No, 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 there's another one. Oh, got it. I know what he's talking about. There, that. Ah, yeah, yes. Ah, got it. Good, good question. This, this ties back to, um, this is, these are the, these binding energies we talked about in the first, first section. So what's happening here is, here's, here's an energy. So, I'm coming along at these energies, I'm below the binding energy of that particular atom, which is carbon, right? So I think this is like 282 EV. So as long as I'm below that binding energy, I don't have enough energy to kick out an electron, but I get above that binding energy. So and I, by the way, as I'm getting closer and closer in energy, the amplitude that an electron in that orbit is making it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I hit this energy, which is the binding energy, and now I can pop some of them out. I can pop some of those electrons out. So what that means is all of a sudden, right above that, um, this material is more absorbing, right? So it, it's easy for it to kick out electrons, and now in some sense it's like a more lossy material. And so that's why the attenuation length drops. It, 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 it needs less material to stop the beam. And, and then of course, as I go up now, and I think I mentioned this last one, now, so below, below the, um, below on this side, I'm, I'm coming in with my light, I'm jiggling the electrons. They are in phase with electric field. The amplitude is getting bigger and bigger. And I hit the binding energy. Now the amplitude is so big right? In, in, if you're doing the equation, it'll just it'll be infinite. But in reality, what happens is you kick out the electron. Now you're on the other side. Now the electrons are moving out of phase with your, um, with your incident applied field. And in their case, then the amplitude gets less and less. And then, you know, it's more transparent. So this is, so this is this kind of a kink is one of those things that you can use to tell you. This is when I was, when I was saying you can learn about the material you have. So if I saw a kink at this energy, I know right away I have some carbon in that material, right? That's the, you know, and then there are other aspects of this kink which show up in. Uh, this is the what you would call uh, uh, the I was going to say the inelastic part, and but then there's a, there's an there's an equivalent effect in the real part of the uh, cross-section, right? So I, I hope that answers that question. And if I ask me again, if it's not. Uh, right, so I showed how we can fix up. Okay, but uh, here we are, <coughs> PLD, <coughs> which is what, what I do for my users on the beam line. So <coughs> zap, the, zap the target material. This is the stuff you want to deposit on the film. And then you get a, fl a plume, and then it, uh, it hits the surface. And what we have on this, the way the surface looks, the, you, in this particular, there are, there are steps on the surface. If you look up, if you look, and these steps, you know, they are like 100 nanometer spacing or something. And so anyway, so we come up, we set this all up. You know, believe me, it's a lot of work to get this experiment set up. Um, <clears throat> and then you send in your X-ray beam. So, you know, I. The, the users handle a lot of the stuff connected with the sample, and I basically provide the x-ray beam and the detector, and you know, some, you know we work together on experiments. Um, so that's the detector. 
and what you can see is you can see a pattern over there and it's, a, it's here a little bit zoomed in here and actually if you see the two white dots here those two white dots tell me about the spacing and the orientation of the, the steps and then the, the other thing that you can also see is sort of this dark region and then there's this bright cloud around that and that just tells you something about the structure of the material on the surface. Um, so it turns out this ring is just when when the particles come in and they organize together this is a t this distance here and reciprocal space tells you a little bit what's the size of those little mounds of stuff. So he is using x-ray diffraction to try to understand the growing film. There's more to it, but I'll just leave it at that for now. Uh, okay, good. So, right. So here, I just, uh, this was the picture that was there, but it was, like, wasn't clear enough. But I just want to show you. Um, so that's me in the back there. And these are my users. And this is the equipment. But the picture on the equipment wasn't that clear. So I just, you know, showed, zoomed it in a little bit here. So this is... This is now kind of really the business end. All the, the beamline stuff and whatever, you try to do it once and get over it. But then on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis, you get a new user coming in, they want to do an experiment. In this particular case here, you can see the blue light. This is a window in a vacuum system. Basically to do a growth system, you have to have, it has to be, it's not quite, it's vacuum but it's, it doesn't have to be fantastic UHV vacuum, but you have to do, you know, do enough work so that you don't have too much contamination. But the blue light <coughs> is um, the plasma that comes, they have, they're, do, they're doing their deposition by a slightly different approach. I talked about the, the laser uh, PLD method, right? In this case, they have a regular source that uses a plasma to generate the particles that are going to be deposited on the sample. And so what you're seeing is the plasma. The beam comes from this KB mirror, which I didn't get a chance to go over. And, um, and then the surface is in there somewhere and the light comes out somewhere over there. And here's my detector, right? And so we basically position the detector in a good place. You know, basically different places in reciprocal space will tell you different things about the material. And so you, we find, so part of my job is figuring out what is the, the experiment that they want to do. And then I try to figure out what's the right way to do it or the best way to do it. My users are most kind of experienced. So they, you know, I don't add too much to them, but sometimes I can help them out. So that's what I do, quote unquote, <clears throat> for my, you know, you know, that's what I'm, that's my job, right? But I have my own research and I'm just going to talk about it in two sec, two minutes since it's stopped. So I work on optics, you know. Um, I try to focus light to small spots. And the way I do this, it's my collaborators. Here are some examples of results. So I, I, this is my best result ever, 113 nanometers. The, the, the truth is that the world record is something like 10 times better than that. So I'm still you know, I have this particular way I'm doing it and I'm, I'm just trying to push it. And all optics have slightly different target audiences. And so I think that I'm hoping that, um, I think my target audience would be people who, who want bigger, slightly bigger optics. The, the, the optics that give you the smallest beams are really tiny. Essentially, they throw away almost all the light. I, I would like to have, um, I think the space I can fit in best is um, my spot sizes are a little bit bigger, but I can get a lot more light into them. So that's kind of where my, my area is. So 139 is my best ever. And then the other thing, oh, that's the other area I, 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 I plan to I kind of work in, which is high, high photon energies. Most, most, of the, most of the optics that people have don't go this high. And um, so, I get 209 nanometers at uh, 77 keV. Uh, and why? So you have to always you always have to know why you're doing an experiment. And so this is an example of why you want to focus on high energies. So there's a particular technique called uh, PDF, 
And uh, so to do PDF best, you need to be at high photon energy. This is 107 keV. And um, in this case, they wanted to study the material, this material under pressure. So here is a diamond anvil cell. It's a, a well-known technique. You take two diamonds, you put a little gasket, and you squeeze the thing. You know, you've got your little screws there. You squeeze it together, and you can create high pressures in this cell. And if you look at it from the top, look at it like that, you'll see something like this. There'll be the gasket. Uh, this thing here was the sample, this black thing. This thing with slightly miscolored thing, that is a ruby that allows them to know what pressure they have in there. Uh, and so my part in this experiment was the following. Um, this stuff here scatters very strongly. It was um, a heavy metal, of rhenium. And so the, the, the goal with the focusing optics is to put as much of the light as possible onto this um, sample, which is about 40, yeah, sample is 40 microns by 25 microns. So I want to put all the light there and I don't want to have any light outside of it because any light outside of it will, will, will provide background to my experiment. So that's, that's why you want to do the experiment. And then um, I guess I'll just stop because it's a little after one, but these are the kind of optics I make. And I make them using even lithography. I work with Aaron Stein at CFN, and this is how I do it. But I'll stop here for any questions. So, any questions? Thank you, <clears throat> Thanks very much uh, for this uh, comprehensive presentation, complementing the one that you gave uh, last week. Uh, so, indeed, uh, People have any questions or comments uh, in addition to the one that we asked during the talk itself? They can always send me emails. Yeah. Um, anybody is interested in coming to BNL to do an experiment? Yeah, yeah that, I, I did get two questions in the last, uh, by email, mm -hmm. last time. Yeah, which I tried, I tried to answer, and um, the it, it's it, the questions of that type, right? So what I can do is, if you have some kind of experiment you want to do at a synchrotron, you I can I can guide you as to maybe where to go, or I I, I would say that first you have to know what it is you want to do. What is it you want to learn about the material? And then that then tells us um, which beam line to go to, which by the way is connected to like which, so, so in today's um, lecture, I covered like which source you might want to go to, right? So the, the point is to know what is it you want to do, what energy is it gonna be at? Um, is, it, is it going to be a spectroscopy or diffraction or imaging? So, so if you have, materials problems out there, um, you know, and you're not sure, you can, you can send me an email and I'll try and answer. Uh, so Kenneth, how many beam lines do you have and what is the, the expected evolution of the facility? Okay, I believe that might actually be on a view graph I stole from one of our higher ups. Uh, no, so, right, oh, so, they're, they're expecting 4,000 users, but we don't really have 4,000 users yet. Mm. Right now, we have like, I think 28 beam lines. Um, and the upper management are always, these beam lines are a little bit expensive to put together. They, the way they did it ended up being, they, 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 they cost more than they should have, but nevertheless, once you've set the precedent, we kind of stuck with it. So, so they really have to work hard to get additional money for new beam lines. And the, the funding facilities, you know, once this one's running, they're off chasing the next fancy machine, right? So right now the next fancy machine is Chicago, in Chicago, they're gonna go through an upgrade. Um, so I'd say we have 28 beam lines. We can do most things and um, you know, most things that you can do at most other synchrotrons. So, but anyway, um, 
let, let me think. Was that did I cover all all yeah. the questions? Yeah. So uh, are all of the dim line instrumented right now? Do they run in parallel or are they oh, yeah, still parallel. still absolutely oh. parallel? So about, I would say on any given day you have say 20-ish beam lines. Okay. Doing experiments for users. I'm really getting there. Uh, Lawrence has a question. Mm. Lawrence, maybe you want to talk yourself? I, read it. I, thought I, just, I typed it into the chat. Oh, I can't read the chat. Oh, okay. So, um, go, going back to your uh, TLD experiments, are the, yeah. the stuff mm -hmm. in the material yeah. were they grown naturally? Is that an epitaxial? Were they grown yeah. on purpose in that way? Or is it, uh, were they cleaved? And then oh, the steps. Were... The steps. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the, 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 the material, the strontium titanate, the S starting yeah. material, they grow, they grow some kind of device structure. You know, they have various um, of these, uh, what do they call complex oxides. They do, you know, um, different films of, say, something ruthenate. Um, so anyway, what you what you saw in that image was strontium titanate, and it turns out that to get the best growth on strontium titanate, it's it turns out it's actually best to have a slight miscut on the sample. So they go through some effort to go to a special source for strontium titanate crystals, which are first of all polished as flat as possible, but with a slight miscut. And the miscut is what gives you the step, the step, the step arrangement. And I think the growth hap I think what it is is the growth happens at step edges, and so then if you have the step edges present, then it grows sort of smoothly. The film grows sort of smoothly. If you didn't have the miscut, you might. I, I think what happens is it grows rough. But I think that's. Um, I, I wasn't involved. I wasn't with them when they went through that learning process. So. At this point, I just know that the samples come in, they have a miscut on them, and that's the best kind of sample to have for, um, for a growth. Now, did I answer your question completely or not? I don't remember. Um, well, I, I guess, yeah, so I was wondering if were they trying to uh, look at catalysis on the different step, like the effect of the microstructure on catalysis, or they were just... So, so um, our kind of experiment, first of all, I should say, essentially, we are looking at just the top the top surface, the top, or the, the film that grows on top of that. And so we, we look at the film as a, as a whole collective, right? Um, so, you know, we might see things like, um, you know, if there's, distribute, there's a, maybe a distribution, when it's growing, there's going to be sort of, um, okay, let's suppose a, a, um, a, a blast of particles hits the film, right? You could see well, what's the average size of those, of, of that little blast? And then as a function of time, you get to see that as, as the film anneals, that, will, will, that, that, that size will grow as the little particles coalesce, right? So you can kind of see that in the diffraction. Um, so we look at, and this is classic diffraction, we look at the average of what's going on in the film. We don't look at, we, our beam is not small enough to, to go to a single step and isolate that. But unfortunately, our, our, th th this experiment is from the old, it's a sort of a brought over from the old light source and it's, right now our beam is better than the machine, the, uh, the diffractometer, but it's just not stable en enough to do something like looking at a single step edge. So, so yeah, we do. We're doing essentially structural structural evolution of the films in a time averaged way, not not in a specific. Um, okay. um, other question or other comments? So Kenneth, last year we had uh, one of the ASP alumni. Uh, uh, Christelle Ikoso from uh, Cameroon. Yeah. And uh, she spent uh, four months at BNL and mm -hmm. she worked with one of your colleagues. Okay. It was, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, when, when, when she went back, 
Um, I had uh, I had I had a meeting with her professors over there who are interested in uh, a more broader collaboration with BNL, mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. especially in the in in the material physics aspects and using the beam, uh, um, the light sources at BNL for that. Um, Christelle is right now um, almost finishing her PhD. She should be finishing in October. Um, mm -hmm. She I. I, I have been in contact with her. She 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 has maintained contact with uh, with Lisa Miller, who was her advisor when she was here. I see. So, I see. so that uh, that has been uh, uh, that was quite useful. So this is basically to tell uh, ASP alumni here that uh, we've had um, you know ASP alumni come to BNL and use this facility and work with uh, uh, some of uh, Kenneth's colleagues. Uh, for, 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 for several months. Um, so it's a program that we, that we, hope, to, we hope to continue, uh, assuming the funding level will stay. Right. Uh, like, yeah, in 2019, there were nine ASP alumni who came to VNL and they worked with uh, various people. Uh, so we, we have a, you know, a, a, a diverse facility, uh, right. uh, you know, at Brookhaven. So you, I guess people, you see that it's not just particle physics. We have stuff in nuclear physics. We have uh, light sources. We have nano uh, sciences, and we have uh, solar energy applications uh, and um, nuclear data science, uh, biology, real biophysics, and stuff like that. So there's a wide range of uh, activities. Um, and so the and then so so besides you know so let's say from from my point of view so uh, we have beam lines that do specific things and so I can guide people to those specific beam lines that match what their interests are and, but then the other thing to think about is sometimes there could be projects which are sort of on the side they're not exactly. Um, um, X-ray related, or you know, it's, you know, there are other things that get done. So uh, there can there can be, you know. I think the person who's interested should have a little bit of a sense of what they want to do, and uh, because they, yeah, because they have to be able to, sh you know. It's it's helpful not to have somebody who knows nothing about something. To come yeah, and that's try right. and do a project. So the yeah, process so they, of getting beam line there, Kenneth, is there, do you, uh, you uh, people, is there a particular time to submit proposal? There is a, correct. Yeah, there correct. is and a actually, process, right? This, yeah. So this, this I do for a lot of users, even users here in the US. Um, so our, our, our typical um, the time to apply to beam line, beam time is, uh, September 30th, which I think is around the corner, right? What's today? Today is September 22nd. 22. Yeah, oh. it's basically, oh, one week. I better do mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, basically you have like a week to, to write a proposal. It's, on, it's all on the web. Um, so if you have an experiment in mind, but it certainly makes, helps to speak to somebody like me. So I guide you. And like I said, I do that for, for people here. Um, I sort of, you know, try to explain what might be the best way to sell your experiment in the, in the proposal, because the proposal reading people have the things that interest them. Um, anyway, so the, the times of the year, September 30th, and I think January 30th, and I think either May or April 30th, I forgot, whatever, it's every four months. Um, so then you, 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 you put in your submission by this time, then over the next three months of, of, you know, three, yeah, basically three months, it gets reviewed, scored, and then it gets thrown into the pile. It's whichever beam line you get assigned to, you know, which matches your experiment, which by the way, you pretty much want to know, you want to know as the experimenter, which beam lines would match your experiments, right? It's not like you just apply, oh, I want to go to light source. No, you have to know huh. what's the experiment I want to do. 
and then which beamline might work. And then you often want to speak to the beamline staff to understand, could I really do this? Or is this crazy given, you know? Um, anyway, so it gets reviewed. And then if you score well, come, you know, and, you know, then you will get assigned beam. So if you submit now in September and you, 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 you get through and win, you might have beam time starting in January. So. Mm. Okay. Um, and now, so for the, for the proposal that gets approved, do they have to have some financial contribution to use the facility? No. So as you know, our approach is, um, you know, and it, it's an international approach. It's not just for US. Um, if you get approved, if your experiment is interesting enough for us to say you should do it, you can come and use the facility for zero cost. However, you do need to get yourself here and take care of your local expenses, you know, somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, so which is the local expenses with, you know, staying in a hotel, getting in and out of the, of the ring, you know, uh, you know, off, off, and as, as you know, BNL, it's, it's a tiny bit difficult to get in and out. Uh, you have to have, you know, if you come from a sensitive country, you know, sense of country it might be Iran, say, um, you have to go through some work to, to get the, it's not, it's not impossible. It's just, you know, some countries are harder to get the permission to be on site than others. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that, you know, so, you know, this, unfortunately with BNL and probably the US in general, it's a lot of paperwork, but mm -hmm. if you do your paperwork, and you have your, 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 your ability to stay in the dorms or whatever, and, you know, pay for that and transportation. You, you, the, the machine itself is free, which is kind of amazing mm -hmm. because of <laughs> what it, if, if you looked at the quote unquote real cost. So write a good proposal, you get beam time for free. That sounds very good. Um, okay, so I don't, I don't have uh, any other question for Ken, uh, Chris, Christine. Maybe you have some stuff. Um, no, no, nothing especially. I mean, just to see the the complementarity of those two different presentations. I think it was excellent to have that. Uh, um, did did we answer the sorry to the last question? Like, uh, what do you do with unwanted beam, which is quite an interesting one too. <laughs> Um, oh, you mean the, the beam that doesn't um, go down the beam line? So to the beam dump, I yeah, would yeah. guess, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, they're, they're, <clears throat> I didn't say anything at all about sort of the safety. This, this was the, the stuff that we, <laughs> we had to agonize in the beam line design and construction. By the way, that beam line I showed you, I was one of the two people who helped you know, who kind of did the design and uh, whatever. Christy, the boss, did most of it, but we were responsible, for, I was responsible for many of the subtasks in that. And one of the, one of the tasks, um, th this one actually, Christy, more worried about it, is um, they, they do try hard to make sure that no unwanted radiation comes down the light, comes down the beam. And so what that means is you have to um, place apertures and beam stops. I didn't show that at all uh, when I was showing parts of the beam line, but there are many places where you put lead blocks, right, around. So if there's some unwanted radiation that hits the lead and stays there. So we actually throw away a lot of light <laughs> to, to focus on the part that we care about. And it, basically that improves the safety. And then I would say that the the impact of that concern about um, the <clears throat> concern about um, unwanted radiation coming down is the the impact is that the it's 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 a, a tricky job to to get the light you want it's it's like threading a needle you know it's actually threading five needles with the same piece of thread right you've got to get it through each optical component. And there's only so much 
room to get through that one. But anyway, so yeah, that, that, so a lot of unwanted light gets stopped and that allows you to walk around the ring without any, any safety and it's, it's checked frequently. Exactly. So for all the aspects of the radiation protection, the fact that this is in America, is it uh, far different than what it would be, for instance, with the, the, the SRF or, or with the diamond? So do you, did you work as well with those different light source or are there then I some did, tests you could do somewhere and not in another I've, I've been to ESRF a couple of times, maybe two times. Um, let's see. I think that I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not really qualified to answer this question, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I think the, the safety considerations for most rings, for most internationally in the synchrotron radiation area, I think is actually kind of uniform now. Um, so all newer rings are, are paying more attention to safety and I would say that the DOE, um, the DOE is a little more obsessive about safety um, now. Uh, and so I, I don't, I think there's a, there's a minimum level that all the rings have. And I, I would say that, you know, I think light source, we, we probably went a little bit beyond, you know, we, we complained a lot. <laughs> the scientists complained a lot about how difficult they made the safety. So, but I think overall, at this point, synchrotron radiation is well understood. Um, you know, so I, I think the, the things that are necessary to have um, safe performance is, is also reasonably well understood. And so, very good. It should be part of that. And maybe one of the, of course, final question, what kind of advice would you give for the, the creation as well or the design of the, the African light source? Hmm. So how to make it different, complementary? We know that this is maybe a bit further in time, but uh, there might be as well some good lesson learned <laughs> or what not to do. Right. So, mm -hmm. broad, huh? well, I think the... The, um, personally, I think that the most important thing are the users, right? And growing your user base and, and, and <clears throat> being able to serve the kind of science. So um, I think it's my personal opinion, and I know others uh, in that committee don't necessarily agree. I don't think we need the absolute brightest, best thing in the world to start with. I think we need something that's inexpensive enough for us to afford, but will nevertheless do the job of providing and growing the scientific knowledge in that area, in this area. And, and then once, once we have, I mean, once we have that, um, and you've got the experience in a bigger user base, and 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 you can and you can convince um, government officials of the value of it. Um, you can go to the next version, which is pretty much what's happened in all around the world, right? Every 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 country is building the next generation, and then they they sort of while they use it for about ten years. After, after about five years, they start planning for the next one out and maybe 15 years down the line or maybe 10 years down the line, they build the next one. And I think it makes sense for us to go down that path rather than trying to build something that's um, very expensive and competitive with all of the existing rings. Potentially, Just a maybe, the, the, maybe also potentially difficult to maintain. So that's one of the things as well, which if it would be state of the art, art would be a bit more difficult maybe right away, but then it would it's, it's imply continue. for the, the funding as well, some continuous support as well, which might be a bit more difficult. Maybe in that right. case, it would be easier to shoot first for something which is very challenging. And then later on, of course, to try to, 
to, to, to get the operation up uh, as a, a stage approach still, but within having all the component that would be expensive right. to buy. Like said, right away it was decided or it was so to, to get as well those uh, with the, the, the multiband achromatos to get for sure at least uh, this kind of revolution up. So maybe that's a minimum. Right. But do you, what do you think on that? Yeah. Um, hmm. So uh, I'll tell you, so if, uh, from, from, I think cost is a really big, a big thing for, for Africa. Um, so I am, one of the things I'm kind of waiting for, I'm hoping for, is sometimes there's a disruptive technology that comes along that changes and maybe changes the cost uh, scale. And so I'll give an example, something I'm paying attention to. It's an old story, but um, so we talked about undulators today, right? Well, one thing you don't, you, you know, there are these projects in certain university labs where they're making undulators, which are on the micron scale. Right. Uh, also, the accelerator, the accelerator itself, the, the, you know, there's, there's these, the, the um, uh, a lot of the cost is in those, in those units, if you could miniaturize it. So there are people working on that. If those, any of those guys make a breakthrough, you might have a sudden, suddenly um, something that may not be as fantastic as one, some of the, like an ESRF or something, but might do the reasonable job at a much lower cost. And that would be, you know, if it turned out that something like that showed up, that would be a good time for someone to, for us to collect money and try and do something like that. That would be a good start. Um, but I, I can see how, it, how, what the infrastructure that's needed for NSLS2. And it's, it's a lot of technology. So that's hard. But first, this is indeed the, the, the conventional facilities as well that may cost yes. a lot too. So once it's yes. there, maybe that's one of the, the good things. And maybe, I mean, Lawrence, I don't know if you're still connected. So if you have some kind of uh, further information in terms of uh, for our students, because in terms of uh, uh, scale as well, when do they get, uh, when do they need to get prepared as well to have a, uh, their, their own research or, or have different type of expertise that would be needed. Would you, Laurent, are you still connected? Yeah, I'm here. I, I, well, I, if you can elaborate a little bit on the, um, the, the story as well of the, the African light source, because one of the things that we were more or less discussing as well from what I understood is that it would be like trying to go for something which is really um, advanced, as advanced as it could be rather than refurbishing, for instance, some kind of part from diamond or, or, or different technology. So what uh, Kenneth is proposing, and I think it could be good as well, just to be alert, looking at if there is any breakthrough, mm -hmm. but then this is a risk as well to wait without potentially having the possibility to, to get this breakthrough for those type of, of technology. So there is always like a how to best define it, because that's a big deal for Africa. So. Mm -hmm. This should be a, a, an aligned strategy, I guess. Right. So do you know yeah, so there, there's a lot of politics and economics that have to be done because we, the bottom line is we have to convince parliaments and, and heads right. of states to invest. Right. And um, I guess the, the conventional wisdom, it can, can, can debate me if I'm wrong here, but uh, you know, the, one of the, the major cost of a storage ring solution light source is uh, you know, all the concrete that you need to uh, lay down the, the, the physical infrastructure. And so the, the, the actual components, like the pictures he showed of the uh, wiggler and the, uh, the undulators and things like that, in terms of the total cost of the overall facility, I mean, it's not an insignificant uh, fraction, but it's not a major fraction. Correct. Um, so now, so so then, 
um, the question becomes, do you want to spend that type of money for components that are, let's say, quote unquote, the best? Now, what do you mean by the best? Because uh, it's what I call um, the, um, it's what I call it the admittance arms race. I don't, Kenneth, right. did you did, did you define emittance in your? Time? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so emittance is basically um, the the um, it's a performance it's metric right. so of the, the light that comes out of the pipe. The angular divergence and the source size, right? Yes. And basically, if you get those small enough, basically you can't do any better. It might as well be a laser. That's what you're right. Yeah. Um, but that's not the and that's not even the sole. I mean, that's significant. But then there's like you know. Um, you know, how fast can the thing pulse, all these other performance metrics of, uh, of a light source. But I think for a lot of it, it just comes down to emittance is the key thing that everyone seems to be trying to drive towards. Um, and, and you get to a point, you, you do get to a point, as Kenneth would say, is that where, um, I mean, how bright do you want this thing, right? Um, that's, that's, but that's the, hidden, the thing is, some of the components, thing. like if you if you if you are taking seconded components, um, like there was a plan to move the NSLS one to Africa. There's rumblings of conversations of moving the uh, when diamond the diamond light source in the UK when it uh, upgrades to move those components to Africa. That'll be good. Uh, uh, right. So, but the components have lifetimes, and so, no. uh, which are, which, you know, are, they're not infinite. So you're spending a lot of money to lay down components that may not have the longest lifetime, and politicians will balk, balk at that. They will, will say, well, why can't we get new components? And okay. There's that. Um, okay. Now that so so this idea of old components has been tried. That was the Sesame model. So um, thirty some odd years ago, uh, Sesame was supposed to be made out of uh, um, an old machine from Germany. So if you went to Sesame today, you would not find the the, the components of the actual facility. Of the actual machine, there aren't many, if any, of those components. The idea of using an old component was a political gambit because they thought they could get something working quickly and have and have something. So Ken, as as Ken would say, you had a machine working, and you can have people working on it, and then you could say, well, we need it. Then you can go and say, well. You know, we're doing good work, but we need to be able to do better. So you're not starting and, from a vacuum. And and we have built up expertise. Yeah. Local expertise. That, that, that's that's exactly. Okay, so now I, would, I will assert, I mean, Sesame is a, is a fantastic place, but I can tell, tell you, I've been told that the components from Germany mm -hmm. were never implemented as a working machine, and they are currently in a, some warehouse in the middle of the Jordanian desert. Right. So okay. So let's so let's put a pin in that. So what can I guess? Um, when he talked about disruptive technologies, one thing I have been uh, sort of advocating is the so-called compact light sources. And uh, Tevi, we should probably have a talk specifically on those. Mm -hmm. So um, so compact light sources are just. I mean, they instead of using. Um, Sort of being based on synchrotron, uh, where you use uh, magnets to bend the path of the electrons, and you have radiation coming out of that. Um, well, there's a lot of different kind of compact, but the most successful compact light source is based on inverse Compton scattering. So you shoot a light, so you have uh, the electrons going around a much smaller ring, much, much, much smaller ring. Um, and then you shoot a laser towards it, and you get inverse Compton scattering. So um, just in terms of cost, 
whereas a facility that like NSLS2 is several hundreds of millions of dollars, if not a billion dollars, a compact light source, um, which is sometimes called tabletop light sources, I mean, if you have a table the size of a building, um, they can cost like 25 million. So two orders of magnitude less. And, and is operating in Germany right now. And there's one operating in Germany right now. Now, there's a whole lot to say about that because <laughs> um, they don't support as many users. Um, they don't give you the photon flux. Um, so for if you're doing protein crystallography, for instance, if you, if you did, uh, there's a protein called lysozyme that if you took it to the protein crystallography line, uh, at beam line at NSLS2, uh, the exposure time of the protein to give you a nice structure is probably less than, less than 10 seconds, probably even less than five seconds. For a compact light source, it takes 21 seconds. So, you know, for two orders of magnitude less cost, I think I can make the graduate student wait for another 17 seconds. Right. But it's still, I mean, it's not even that simple. It's, there's, a, there's a lot to consider because um, the commercially available compact light source comes more or less as a kit. It's fully assembled. It can be remotely operated. And you don't get that type of expertise in terms of the beamline scientists who have to care and feed for the storage ring every day. Um, the uh, the people like Ken who are uh, like a, who take care of a beamline, so you don't get the accelerator physics part, and you don't get the beamline optics part, you don't get the beamline mechanical systems part, all the electricians and every everything in between that you need to make a facility work that is kind of uh, all black boxed. So there's a lot to think about when you talk, go to go to compact light sources. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think definitely that's one of the things that we also had while we were discussing or bringing as well the, those light source into the the discussion for the or during the yeah the African school as well. We had with uh, Lucas Serafini as well. Right? So you know him as well from the INFN with uh, right. those different developments. So he was showing how first compact light source would then later on with gaining expertise in one country would bring as well more capacity as well to build the. the the, the, the light source, which would be for a much longer period of being under construction and getting as well the need for more funding and all things. So it would be a way to raise the up as well the capacity in the country because as Kenneth said, I think this is definitely the big and the, 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 the main point uh, that will be potentially a difficulty as well there. So or to bring through collaboration as well the way to exchange uh, and have uh, this expertise in a given time and then to have a uh, uh, yeah, a scaled approach towards this light source because it, it's a long way, of course. I mean, we see this already in, uh, in places where the industry is, uh, is really, I mean, with a, a lot of capacity. So, so this is not an easy one. So maybe this is one way, but I see it as well, and you certainly understood it as well from uh, the, um, the African light source. It looks like it's, it's a different school. <laughs> so it's really something that uh, is not maybe the direction that some of uh, the the, the, the people would like to go because they want to, to, to get something bright right away. Yeah. So, so, so this is the thing that we need maybe to, to look at. It, which is, doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be looking at both at the same time. You know, when you make a, a market survey as well, you need to develop as well the capacity within Africa to have first the users. This is one of the big things. So which type of users would be there if it's for the, the protein crystallography, for instance, which is something which is really need for sure. But it could be as well for everything that we are speaking about, for instance, for all those pandemic or, or all those kind of capacity as well to be independent. Uh, so those countries being more independent, that would potentially mean whether this is for um, I mean, different type of research to, to, to then at the end focus on it should be with the, the compact uh, accelerator or it would be for more for, for the, the light source itself. Huh? So this is like uh, yeah, an overall view of, uh, of right. what is needed that is to be conducted. Yeah? Right. right. And I, I can tell you, so, so we, we, one of the things that we 
try to sell the, with the African light source is the, the, the role it could play in uh, sort of drug discovery and you know, disease reduction. But you know, the main challenge of protein crystallography is not the light source. So the, the, the light source is kind of like the happy end of the beginning. Uh, you know, when you actually have crystals that you can go off to the light source with, which these days you can actually send the crystals. You don't have to send, you don't have right. to go there yourself. You could right. send the crystals and watch the whole thing happen on, right. you know, on your computer. Right. Um, but you need just basic biochemistry labs. Right. And yeah. yeah, it'd be kind of a cry and shame if you know all the money went into building this like huge machine and you still have biochemistry labs that don't have enough pipettes and Right. You know, That's agents point. and things like that. So there's, mm -hmm. um, and there's something to be said about if you're at a university and you're doing a biochemistry, you know, you're trying to be a, a, a crystal protein crystallography laboratory, that you have all the wet biochemistry that you have, and all you have to do is take your your, your protein down the hall, and you know use a compact light source instead of having to package it and send it to you know wherever uh, even if you have even if the so if you're in say cape town south africa and, and the, let's say the african light source is in ghana i mean that is not a, that's a, that's not a short trip you, you still nope. have to like pack it with ice and uh you'll probably still be you probably have to send the entire doer yep. um which are which are heavy you know so um. So I just wanted to add that, by the way, I gave you my personal opinion, yeah. but, you know, basically I'm working with the group, whatever the group decides is the right direction, I'll work with them, but at least you know what my personal opinion is, so. Right, and so, so Ken and I, we're not that much different. I, I just say that the, the dis disruptive technology is already here. In, in the in the in the embodiment of compact light sources, right? Because you could, so twenty so twenty five million dollars could get a university an entire facility with, uh, you know, so they 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 come with the light source and then you can buy experimental hutches that sort of connect to it and you can in when whatever building you put this thing in, you know, you could align the experimental hutch. So that the you know the light comes out of the pipe and into the hutch, and you can swap out different experiments as uh, as you go along. So like one week you're running protein crystallography, and then next week you may be doing X-ray scattering, you know, small X-ray scattering or something like that. And if you have an you know ten to twelve universities that do that, that would be you know. 20, 30 beam lines between them. That's a lot of working beam lines for only a couple of hundred million dollars. Anyway, that's, yeah. my, two, that's my two cents. Yeah. I, th I think, but we, we will have uh, as well some presentation about uh, the, the Compton one and about the, the compact uh, accelerator. Yeah. I think it would be good as well for all our, I mean, students to be able as well to have their own understanding as well of the difference so that we can really maybe have a, then later on some kind of a more advanced debate. So I don't know, Ketavi, do you want to? No, I think uh, we should stop, uh, stop now. Exactly. Uh, we have yeah. discussed a lot and... Uh, but very interesting nevertheless. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so I would like to thank uh, Kenneth uh, for being available. Uh, in the meantime, there were two statements on the chat. Um, uh, no, maybe now one. Said, are you still there? Do you want to briefly talk about your question or your comment? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, firstly, I'd like to say a very big thanks to Kenneth. That was a very wonderful session. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> actually, what I posted on the chat was that um, basically what it's, it's actually, it has to do with the writing proposal for PhD yeah. and projects and internship like this. So some of us here, yeah, we are like in our second year of masters, some are even in undergrad, they haven't done that before. 
So we need guidance on how to go about it. So I was imploring Ketevi if we could actually organize a session whereby people from various fields like nuclear physics, high energy particle, other stuff, they could come around and just give us guidance on those things that are expected of us to be put inside the proposal, how we could arrange them so that it will meet the criteria of what they want at the place we are intending to send it to. So that's yeah. actually my so, comment. Yeah, so you, there will be, I will give a talk uh, sometime in November about the ASP mentorship program. So um, that talk will give um, a bit of information related to what you are talking about and uh, you know how we get um, ASP alumni into the program where they can then interact directly with uh, the mentors and and get guidance on on uh, on all of these uh, academic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, academic things that are necessary for you to succeed, but that may not be directly related to what research you are doing. Yeah, so it's a very important point. That is true. Yeah, so we we feed that into the mentorship program, which hasn't yet been discussed in this lecture series. But there is a there will be a, there will be a talk on it in November. Thank you very much. If I, let me add something, which is, you know, based on your question, um, I'm going to think about maybe I can, I, I don't know if I can do this yet, but I'm going to think about uh, writing a, a t tutorial talk on how to apply to NSLS2. Um, and based on the, the, way I, the way our process goes, you know, so I'm not sure. If I, I'll I'll give it a shot, and if I can if I can do it, then I'll tell KTV, and then maybe I can give another talk on how to write how to apply to NSLS too. Yeah, that would be fine. Gen, yeah. General synchrotron in you know synchrotron in general. What are the what are the things to put in your proposal that will improve your chances? Yeah, I appreciate that very much. Um, all right, so I think. Um, on that note, uh, we should stop here. Um, it has been really enriching. It was uh, quite a lot. Uh, um, Kenneth, thanks a lot. Um, Thank you. Lawrence as well, uh, thanks for contributing to the discussion. That was very nice. Christine and all the participants. So uh, let's stop for now. We'll continue the lecture series on Thursday. Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Nice talk. Bye. Bye.